It's rough. All right. If you got a Bible, though, let's grab our Bibles. Let's go Genesis 39. Grateful for the Word of God today. Every day we get together, every weekend we get together, we open up God's Word. We believe it's breathing, living, active. I don't know what you think about God's Word, but it is not a rule book to follow. It's a love story between God and humanity that shows us how to live our fullest life. And today, we're going to be in Genesis 39. As you're turning there, I want you to think back on the last time you had a life-altering moment. Now, according to Cambridge Dictionary, they define life-altering as an event that's strong enough to change someone's life. So it is that moment that literally splits the timeline of your life like B.C. and A.D. There's life before the moment, and then there's now life after the moment. And and life-altering moments can can be good. There there can be good things in your life that have created that. But of course, then there's also hard, difficult things. So I'll give you a good example for my, for my life that kind of split the timeline. A life-altering moment happened on August the 28th, 2010, when my wife and I welcomed our first child, our son, Shaw, into the world. And on that day, for the very first time, we became parents. And I mean, literally, if you are a parent, you remember those days. There was the BC days before children. Some of you have parented so many kids for so long, you don't even remember those days. Let me remind you, you used to get more sleep and have less gray hair and have more sanity. You used to have a hobby. (gasps) Remember that? You had more money in the bank account. Like you did what you want, when you wanted it. Like every single night was date night. And then you decided to have you a kid. That's on you, bro. That's all I'm saying. And of course, you wouldn't take it back, you know, but it's a life altering moment. Um, when we had Shaw, of course, we had no expectation when, we, uh, when my wife gave birth up at Presbyterian here in Charlotte. And it was an incredible experience, let me just tell you. I mean, it was so good. We had two more of these little humans. And I'll never forget like that first time in the hospital, um, we give, you know, Emily gives birth, the team did amazing. Then we go to this postpartum wing and we had this big room with a beautiful view of the Charlotte skyline. And there was a couch with a pullout bed and the nurse staff like literally waited on us hand and foot around the clock. They were right there when I changed his diaper for the first time, when I gave him his first bath, when Emily first started nursing. And then there was this like little red button. Every time you pushed it, within minutes, another nurse was at your beck and call to get whatever you want. It. I was like, this is amazing. And then that first night, so Shaw was born at 3.30 in the morning. So that next night, almost 24 hours later, the nurse comes in and she, she says, hey, um, if you would like, we have an overnight nursery where we could take your son and a group of professional nurses will watch him around the clock so you can get some sleep. Now, every dude in the room knows that's not your call to make. And inside, I'm praying, dear Jesus, let her say yes. Please, Lord, let her say yes. And I know some of you are like, no, you need to bond with your baby. The first 40 hours are so important. That's great. You do you, sweetheart. I'm just grateful that my wife looked at that nurse and said, yes, take him. I got 18, I got 18 years to bond with this boy. I'm getting a good, nice rest. I'm telling you, like after 48 hours, I was like, I'm crushing this parenting thing. And then on the third day, the the nurse walks in, again, big smile on her face. This time she has a wheelchair. She's holding a balloon with a big sign that says, congratulations. She looks at Emily and says, hey, um, you're healthy. Baby's good. Today, you get to go home. In which I said, great. Which one of you are coming with us? (laughs) She thought I was playing. She's like, oh, you're going to be great parents. I was like, how do you know that? You don't know me. You didn't do a background check on me. I could be a horrible person for all you know, and you're just gonna let me walk out of your institution with another life. Can you tell I was dramatic my whole life? She's like, you're the dad, you're on the birth certificate, you'll figure it out. So there's the three of us leaving the hospital, all three crying for three different reasons. (laughs) A powerful moment that changed my life. And I bet you've been through a life-altering moment. Some bring back sweet memories. And I'm afraid to guess that most bring back a lot of emotion of difficulty. What is it that prepares us for these moments? Like Emily just seemed to be well more prepared to be a mother than I was prepared to be a father. I'm I'm not talking about life after the moment. I'm talking about the life leading up to the moment. I like how one author says it. He says that the moment doesn't define the life. It's the life that defines the moment. I want you, I like that. I want you to get that. We often think that the moment impacts the rest of my life, but really it's the life that you lived that determines the moment. So here's the question on the table today. How do you prepare a life for a life altering moment? 
Well, more on that in a minute. Today, we're in part two of our series, Shattered Dreams, When Life Goes Off Script. We're studying an Old Testament character in the book of Genesis, a guy by the name of Joseph. And today, I wanna just kind of talk about that theme right there. I wanna talk about an altered life. See, when a dream is shattered, a life is altered. So how do you prepare a life for a life altering moment? Well, last week we met Joseph. He was 17 years old in Genesis chapter 37. His life spans from 37 all the way to chapter 50. Uh, We learned uh, that Joseph at 17 years old came from a very dysfunctional family. If you come from a very dysfunctional family, there's hope for you. I mean, Joseph's father, Jacob, fathered 12 children amongst four women, two of which were his wives, two were concubines, and the two wives were sisters. Figure that family reunion out. That's awkward. And yet Jacob, the father, had two favorite sons, Joseph, number 11, and Benjamin, the baby, at number 12. And we found out last week that the reason why he loved these two more than the others is because those were the only two sons that came from his one true love, one of his wives, Rachel. Now, you would think that as a dad, you wouldn't let the other kids know that you like Joseph more, but not Jacob. All the other kids knew that, that Joseph was his favorite which of course breaks the cardinal rule unspoken of parenting, that if you have a favorite kid, you don't let the others know. Jacob didn't read the parenting book. He spoiled Joseph. Therefore, Joseph grew up entitled, prideful, arrogant. And at 17 years old, God gives Joseph a dream. And it's a dream of leadership. It's a dream that one day Joseph knew God was gonna use him to save and redeem a lot of people. He actually knew that one day his family would bow at his feet. But Joseph at 17 didn't have the emotional intelligence to keep it to himself. So he went out and bragged to his brothers, which I'm one of three boys and I kind of get this. I looked for any opportunity to rub how great I was in front of my brothers. And that's what Joseph did. And it just fueled their hatred for him even more. Till one day they abducted him, attempted murder, where they eventually sold him to slavery to the Egyptians for 20 shekels of silver, which is the equivalent of a Carowind season pass plus a meal plan. They sold their brother for an entry level pair of Jordan ones, two rounds of golf with a buddy. This is equivalent to 200 US dollars. They hated him. Now, if I could come to Joseph's defense, because he deserved, I mean, not deserved, he did a lot to lead to that moment, but in his defense, all right, and if you're a parent raising boys, How many of you are raising boys right now? I'm curious. Boys, boys, boys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's great. Okay, I'm gonna give you a lot of peace of mind. You ready? Um, Did you know that biologically, the male brain is not fully developed until age 25? And you're laughing because you're like, okay. And the last part of the brain to develop is what's called the frontal cortex, which is like right here, which is the person's ability to make good decisions. This is why dudes do a lot of really dumb things. I'm not justifying it, I'm just clarifying why your son is doing what they're doing. Their frontal cortex has not fully been developed. Guys do a lot of really dumb things, kind of like this right here. (laughs) And that is why statistically women live longer than men. Right there. Now, here's what we know. How many of y'all saw that video? You saw the phone around and out? Yeah, yeah. Here's what you know about that video without anybody telling you, okay? The person in the bubble is a dude, probably in his 20s, who was dared by other people in their 20s who are also dudes, all of which do not have their frontal cortex developed yet. (laughs) The point is, you can't judge Joseph off of what he did when he was 17 years old. Because aren't you grateful that your life is not defined by what you did as a teenager? (laughs) But in Genesis chapter 39, Joseph grows up. Matter of fact, in the span of one chapter, eight years is going to lapse. And we're gonna actually see him build a life that prepares for another life-altering moment. So today, let's just let Joseph teach us today as our hearts are open and hopefully your hands are ready to receive this today. Genesis chapter 39, starting in verse one, says this. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. So Joseph is roughly 300 miles from home. His beloved father, Jacob, thinks that he's dead. And his 11 brothers think that they just got away with the heist of a lifetime as they have a little bit more cash in their pocket. Meanwhile, their flesh and blood is tied to a caravan heading down to a pagan land called Egypt. 
More than likely, Joseph would have gotten brought into the middle and in the center of the city where the market was. Because in this day, we, you would go to the market not just to purchase food, but to purchase people. No doubt they untied him, stripped him of his clothes, and they began to assess his worth, and they would have taken um, his weight, his height, checked his body mass and his muscle mass, looked for fleas and cuts and bruises, anything that would reduce his market value. Then the bidding began. This is horrible. No doubt that day in walks Potiphar. Potiphar was one of Pharaoh's leading officials. He was there to purchase additional help at his own house. The text doesn't say this, but I think with one look at Joseph, he's like, I gotta have that guy. There's something about him. So when it was Joseph's turn, up on top of the selling block, Potiphar made sure he outbid everybody, and that day, he bought him. For how much? We'll never know. The text doesn't say. But there's Joseph in Egypt. Doesn't know the culture, doesn't know the food, doesn't speak the language, doesn't know the people, and all of the odds are against him. And when you find yourself in Egypt, all the odds are against you. See, Egypt represents life after the shattered dream, after the letdown, after the heartache. It's you waking up, realizing that this disease is still in my body. It's you waking up the next day, not going back to the same job that you worked at for 20 years. It's waking up the next day in a different city that's foreign to you. Or maybe some of you are really dealing right now with the pain of waking up, realizing you're no longer married and the weight on your left hand ring finger is disproportionate because you don't have the ring anymore. Like Egypt is that place in your life you never thought that you would be. That's where Joseph is. And now we're gonna see what does he do for another life altering moment, verse two. The Lord was with Joseph so that he, so that the Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered and he lived in the house of the Egyptian master. And when his master saw that the Lord was with, with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household. He entrusted him to his care and everything that he owned. So Joseph arrives in Egypt with nothing but the clothes on his back, the dream in his heart. And within eight years, he works his way up to being the leader in Potiphar's house which tells us for eight years, he, he was a man of integrity. He worked hard, did the right thing, learned the language, learned the customs. He was respectful, yet never compromised his Jewish beliefs in the one true Yahweh God. And Potiphar noticed this, like everything Joseph touched, he succeeded. And, and over and over, you're gonna see this theme in the book of Genesis. It's gonna tell you over and over that God was with him. The Lord was with him. And what was the result? He was successful. So here's what this tells you and I. That success is not predicated on your position, but rather predicated on God's presence. Do you see this? So you might be in a location today that you don't wanna be in, but if you've got the presence of God with you, you, then you've got everything you need to thrive in your Egypt, to thrive right where you're at, because your location, your position is not as important as making sure you've got the presence of God with you. Do you believe that today? It doesn't, yeah, you might be in a spot that you never thought you'd be, but if you've got his presence, you've got everything. So, so this is the first thing. If we're gonna build a life for a life-altering moment, number one, I gotta make God's presence my priority. That's what Joseph does. I gotta make it my priority. What you don't prioritize today, you cannot pull from tomorrow. You cannot draw water from a well that you did not dig. And you cannot take out something that you never put in. Meaning you can't wait to have faith until you need faith. You can't wait to build courage until you actually need courage. It's too late. You can't muster up something that you don't already have. And what you don't invest in today, you cannot pull from tomorrow. Especially when it comes to pain. Like, here's the thing about pain. Um, pain always pushes you into whatever it is you're already close to. You, you know this. Pain is never neutral. When pain hits your life, it pushes you into what you have already prioritized. All right, I wanna show you this visually, okay? Um, I'm gonna, will you guys help me welcome Zach uh, to the stage? Come here, get up here, Zach. Help me welcome Zach here. So... Zach is our music director at LifePoint, just joined the team, does a phenomenal job. I'm telling you, as talented as he is, his heart for the Lord um, exceeds any talent he has. And so we're grateful for you. Thanks, man. And that's a really nice way because you know what's coming next. I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna push you a lot. Okay, all right. So, so let's go with this, right? So, so pain hits your life and it, and it pushes you into whatever it is that you're close to. So I'm gonna represent pain and Zach's gonna represent us. 
So if you already walk with the Lord, you have a relationship with God, when, when that pain comes, more than likely it's gonna push you into deeper dependency on Christ. Now, this is not a theory. I've literally seen this. Um, some of our friends last year went through one of the hardest seasons um, I've ever seen anybody go through, um, a parent's worst nightmare. And yet I watched the pain push them into a deeper dependency on Christ because they had dug that well for so many years before the moment ever happened. It was almost as if they were a drawing from a Holy Spirit reserve tank. It's the only explanation for why in the middle of a funeral service, worship can break out. It's the only explanation as to why when you should be in a corner in a fetal position, you're standing upright with a little bit of hope and eternity on your heart. It's because when the pain comes, it's gonna push you towards whatever it is you're already close to. Church, this is why I want, I want you in a life group this winter. Life groups, if you're not familiar, are small groups of adults that meet in homes all around the greater Charlotte, Fort Mill area. I think we have like 60 life groups. Um, that's where real community takes place. You can only get so much community here in a room like this, but if you join a serve team and get in a group, um, that's where the backbone of life point is. And I want you there because when pain comes, it's gonna push you, and I want it to push you into good, godly people. People who are gonna encourage you, lift you up, bring you back to the truth of God's word and not just tell you what you wanna hear. All right, so if this is true about good things, I, this is also true about negative things. So pain, it, it can push you into a deeper mentality, it can push you into a deeper hole of depression. It can push you deeper into that addiction, into that bitterness. If you're not careful, you can actually feel like you're distant from God. So what we think a lot of times when pain hits, if we're honest, is that we can handle it. Like, I'm good, man. I got it. I don't need nobody. Like, I can get through this. And I'm going to give it to you. I bet you can. I bet there's a lot of things in life that you can get through, but you can't get through the loss of your mom. You're not ready to receive what you're gonna find out about your kid one day. You, you can't get through everything in life. So it's my priority to prioritize what matters the most and ultimately the godly things that I wanna get pushed into. Do you see this? It's also my responsibility to mature my faith. Can I help you this year? It is nobody's responsibility to grow your faith and deepen your relationship with the Lord other than you. That's your job. Yes, a pastor can help. Yes, the church can help. Yes, your small group can help. At the end of the day, it's my responsibility for me to grow me. And faith is like a muscle. The more you use it, the more it grows. Like nobody is just born with faith. I trust God, I step out, my faith grows. I trust God, I step out, my faith grows. But if you remain at the spiritual level of like a 13-year-old, your entire life, it's no wonder why you get, you're not 13, you're 25. It's no wonder why you get like tossed and turned and thrown around because you don't have the spiritual build to actually sustain what it is you're going through. No, you need a different kind of build. You need a Bruce build. Come up, Bruce, you here? Come up here, Bruce. Y'all help me welcome Bruce to the stage. You need that NFL Maryland Terp 66315 offensive lineman Bruce build. This is, this is what you need. Now, now, if you could choose the spiritual build of Bruce or the 25-year-old musician, <laughs> which one would you take? Oh, yeah, yeah, the, the Bruce build. And Bruce, you, you, I know when you saw him, you're like, he had to play in the NFL, had a, had, had a career, man, ran a 4-7 ran a the NFL combine, held the record for seven years, offensive lineman, over 300 pounds, redefined what an offensive lineman is, man, <laughs> crazy. So even if you get a Bruce build spiritually, pain's still gonna come, and, it, and it's gonna push you. <laughs> <laughs> I thought we talked about this. I gotta get a little bit... <laughs> It's, it's going to push you into whatever it is you're close to. But if you've got that maturity when that pain comes, when you've got that Christ in you, Holy Spirit reserve, when you begin to realize that my life has been anchored on the solid word of God, that, that there's nothing that can, that can take away my loving relationship with the Lord because i got that Apostle Paul eternal mentality to live as Christ, to die as gain. Heaven's on my mind, so come on, pain. This earth isn't all there is. Even when you got that in that life and that push comes, all 190 pounds of me pushing this, it's gonna push you, but you're gonna be able to bounce back and you're gonna bounce back stronger and more resilient because you've got that Bruce build. <laughs> See, I can't, I can't wait until I'm in the pain to need the presence of God. 
I need it now. I need God's word now. I need prayer now. I need church now. I I need confession now. I need accountability now so that when my Egypt comes and it's coming, it will not push you and destroy you, but it will push you in a way that actually grows you. Help me thank Bruce. Help me thank Zach. Thank you guys. Love you guys. Appreciate you, man. Appreciate you. Y'all aren't gonna remember anything I said except for Bruce build. That's fine, that's fine. You know who else understood the power of the presence of God? Can I take you on a detour real quick? Uh, In the Old Testament, a guy by the name of Moses. This is quick, Moses uh, in Exodus 33. This This is really important. He's leading roughly two million Israelites. He's just let them out of Egyptian slavery and he goes to God in prayer and he's like, Lord, um, what's the next step? I don't know how to protect these people. I don't know how to feed these people. You're not giving me the next step. And that's his prayer to God. And listen um, to what God says in verse 14. The Lord replied, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. So God's answer to Moses' request for the play-by-play plan is I'm gonna give you something better. I'm gonna give you my presence. Because if I gave you the plan, then you wouldn't need me. So I'm gonna give you me. And I love what Moses' response is. This is the maturity that I ascribe to. I'm not there yet. Verse 15, Moses said, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. Moses preferred to go nowhere with God than anywhere without him. Wow. God, I'd rather go nowhere with you than try to go everywhere without you. And church, this is my prayer when you find yourself in a season of Egypt, a place you never thought that you would be, is that you would begin to ask God, I need more awareness of your presence. And I want us to have good theology. I'm not indicating that somehow you need more of the presence of God in you. The the Bible says that the moment you gave your life to Christ, the fullness of God came in. So you can't get any more God than the God that you got when you gave your life to Christ. It's not like you're spiritually leaking. And when I sin, I leak a little bit of his presence. And when I don't go to church, I leak a little more of his presence. That's not, this thing, your relationship with him is so air sealed tight. It's because the resurrection in the tomb is still empty. So what I need is more awareness of what I already have. God, give me awareness that you are with me every step of my life. This is what ultimately allowed Joseph to succeed the presence of God. Look at verse five, from the time he put him in charge of his household and all of the, all, uh, everything that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because Joseph, the blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in his house and in the field. Things are going great, but they're about to take a turn for the worse. So Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care with Joseph in charge, and he did not concern himself with anything except the food that he ate. And you're going, that doesn't seem like a turn for the worse. Finish reading. Now Joseph was well built and a handsome man. Apparently, it can actually be a negative thing if you're too good looking. I wouldn't know anything about it, but apparently this dude was a head turner. All right, Joseph was a good looking dude. He had that Denzel, that young Denzel look, that Jamie Foxx smooth. He had that Matthew McConaughey, you know, Southern Texas kind of talk about him. He was a dark skin, curly hair, bulging biceps that bulged every time he took Mrs. Potiphar's tray, which happened a lot because Mrs. Potiphar laid her eyes on him. Look at verse seven. And after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and she said, come to bed with me. And that means exactly what you think it does. Now, this is the first lady of the house hitting on a Hebrew boy who's roughly 25 years old. Now, we don't know how old Mrs. Potiphar is, but you can draw a good conclusion upon contextual clues that she's somewhere in her 40s or 50s. Now, we have a word, don't we, for older women who pursue younger men? We call, we call her a what? A, a, a cougar. I think maybe she was a cheetah. Cheat? Okay, bad joke. That's a... Verse eight. But he refused. He refused this open door invitation. He said, ma'am, with me in charge... My master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything that he owns, he's entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? Notice that. 
So the second way that you prepare a life for a life-altering moment, number two, is I have to stand in my character. You can't wait until she slips you the hotel key to somehow muster up integrity. You build character every day in the small areas of your life when no one is looking. And when you win those little things, then you might be able to withstand the big things. And did you notice that he said, I don't want to sin against God? When I first read that, I thought, well, what What about Potiphar? Like you would be sinning against Potiphar, right? And I think he cared about Potiphar. Potiphar was just not his top priority. God was. See, self-discipline will only take you so far. If the reason why you resist the temptation is because of your spouse, uh, your children, um, your self-image, it's only a matter of time until that discipline will wear down. I can resist any temptation on any given day, but all it takes is one day. That's all it takes. And if all you are is self-discipline, eventually it will wear you down. But godly character is what pushes you through because godly character is always concerned with what does God think about this first. Yes, I care about my wife, but I care about what God thinks more. And so here's this moment. What's he gonna do? The invitation. She begins to wear him down, verse 10. And though she spoke to Joseph day after day, Day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. Joseph had everything he needed to commit this act. Matter of fact, every moral failure that you have ever had, any compromise, any sin in your life, even though I don't know the specifics, is because you've had too much of these two things. It's too much privacy and too much opportunity. The soil for sin please hear me, is too much privacy and too much opportunity and not enough accountability. He, he knew the house better than anyone. He ran the staff. He knew where the security cameras were. He knew Potiphar's schedule when he comes and when he goes. He had access to every single room in the house. He had as much privacy and opportunity as he needed. And when you and I have too much privacy and too much opportunity and not enough accountability, you will fall eventually. I'm gonna say it again. Too much privacy, too much opportunity, not enough accountability, you will fall eventually. I know this because it's happened to me. So here's a story that I'm not proud of. When I was a sophomore in college, um, sophomore in college, I was at um, Bible college studying to do ministry, and I applied for this internship at a really um, respected church. Uh, the kind of church that, you know, would open up a lot of doors and a lot of people would apply. They take four interns every summer. I got accepted. I was so thrilled. Couldn't wait. Personally, going through a lot of my personal life, family, uh, parents were separating and divorcing, just a lot going on. Well, that Christmas, um, over winter break, uh, on New Year's Eve, I thought, you know what? This has been a horrible year. I'm going to party this night away. I'm in Ohio, I called my buddy up at a neighboring college. I said, yo, I, let, let me come up. He goes, come on, we're gonna have a good time tonight. I had so much opportunity. I was 100 miles from home, three states removed from my college, and I had all the privacy that I needed with no accountability. And we partied that night, and it was fun in the moment. And I'll never forget, we're walking back to his college, to his dorm, and there's this like little country gas station, and we decided to kind of stop and to go inside of the gas station where in walks out of this little, it's not even a main highway, it's like country road back roads, in walks the youth pastor that I'm doing the internship with, his sister, and she knows me. If you've ever had this moment, you like try to sober up real quick and you realize this isn't great, and so I knew what was gonna happen two days later, I get a phone call and it's the youth pastor of the church that he accepted me to come do this internship with. And he said, Nate, um, I, you know I love you and you know I'm for you and I know you're going through a lot, um, but you're not ready for this. So I gotta take back this internship. And then he said something I'll never forget. It stuck with me, what, 22 years later. He goes, Nate, you know stupid doesn't fix stupid. Like I know you're going through a lot and there's some things that are going on, but you don't fix a mess by making a bigger mess. Stupid doesn't fix stupid. And that hit me so hard. And I just feel like there's somebody today, maybe you are on the brink of a moral failure because you have too much privacy, too much opportunity and not enough accountability. Hear me, stupid doesn't fix stupid. You don't fix a struggling marriage with an affair. 
You don't fix debt by adding more debt. You don't fix addiction by adding more addiction. You've gotta lower your opportunity, lower your privacy, raise your accountability. This is what Emily and I do. A couple examples, one of our like boundary rules is neither one of us are ever alone with somebody of the opposite sex, ever. N- not staff, not, not friends. Emily has full access to my phone, my every email, my internet history, everything that I have is hers and and vice versa. Why, because she doesn't trust me? No, because she loves me. I have two buddies in college that we talk all the time, they're my accountability partners. I've given them full permission to ask me anything. They can call Emily and confirm anything they want to at any time and I don't get offended. Why, because I'm weak? No, actually because it makes me strong. Because on any day, I can withstand any temptation, but all it takes is one day. And if you've got too much privacy and too much opportunity and not enough accountability, one day, your day will come. So here's Joseph trying to do the right thing. And she began to wear him out one day. Look at verse 11. One day he went into the house to attend to his duties and none of the household servants were inside. She caught him by his cloak and said, come to bed with me. But he left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. And when she saw that he had left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house, she called her servants in and said, look, this Hebrew has been brought to us to make a sport of us. He came in here to sleep with me. She flipped the script. But I screamed And when he heard me, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. In verse 20, here comes Mr. Potiphar. Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. Joseph had done nothing wrong. He made a fortune for his employer. He managed his master's estate. He kept the house tidy, ran a tight ship, always balanced the budget, adapted to the new culture, resisted sexual temptation. And how did God repay him for this? a two-year prison sentence with no sign of parole. See, even when you stand in godly character and you do the right thing, there are times it will cost you everything. And so as the chapter closes, there's Joseph. It seems as if the dream has been shattered even more when in reality, God had him one step closer to where ultimately he needed him. But today we're gonna leave Joseph in the prison until next Sunday when Pastor Chris tries to get him out. But today I ask you, are you preparing a life for a life altering moment? Here's the final way. I think that this is the most applicable. The way that you do it, I need God's presence, stand on my character, but I do it one day at a time. Don't, don't get overwhelmed right now. It's, it's, it's just win today. It's the power of, of the day. It's why Jesus said, don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow's got enough worries on its own. Just win the day. And guess what? If I do the right thing today and love Jesus today and show up today and forgive today and put myself in the right situations today and resist temptation today and live an honest, open, vulnerable life, transparent life today, I'm gonna stack up some days. I'm gonna stack up some weeks. Then I'm gonna stack up some months. And the next thing you know, I got a year, two years under me and I'm living the life that I know God wants me to live. But today I gotta win. I gotta win the day. So as we close, here's what we've learned about a dream that God gives you. The dream will be different than you thought, harder than you realized, slower than you'd like, but better than you could imagine. So I'm gonna have a moment just to pray. And I don't know how the Lord is working in your life, but the band's gonna come out and they're gonna sing a song, but really the song is a prayer. And so we're gonna put three different prayer prompts on the screen so that you and the Lord can just begin to do some working. And what is it, God, that you're asking me to do? God, where do you have me? I wanna survive. I wanna prepare a life for a life-altering moment. So Father, right now, we just give you these moments. Thank you for your word. God, thank you that you meet us right where we're at. That even when we fail and when we compromise, you love us and you use us. God, it is not, grace is not permission to sin. No, 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 no. Grace is what empowers us to live the life that you died for us to live. And so God, when we find ourselves in Egypt, in this new normal that we did not want, that we do not like, we are not gonna compromise, God. We're gonna cling to your presence. So Lord, right now, would you speak to us?